Hello everyone. Thank you very much for, for assisting our session today. So um, my name is Daniel Gersami. I'm a principal cloud solutions architect working for Morantis for about um, five years now. I will be accompanied by Christian Hubner, who is uh, our director of services uh, uh, of architecture at Morantis and also Vasil Saiko, who remotely joins us as a principal DevOps uh, engineer at Veronitis. So today we'll be talking about how not to fail running OpenStack uh, on Kubernetes at scale. Um, we'll go into uh, details on what we mean by scale, uh, the experience we have running Kubernetes at scale. We've been running Kubernetes, uh, sorry, OpenStack at scale. We've been running OpenStack for around more than 10 years now. Uh, we are one of the major contributors of OpenStack. We deployed OpenStack at scale for various customers, like at and the US, which is one of our major customers. And we did reach into some of the scalability challenges with them. Uh, so today we'll be explaining some of the uh, results of the uh, experimentation and development we did with them, and the solutions that we, we brought on the table. So basically, one thing that is important to understand is what is actually scale, right? There are very various ways of seeing, seeing scale. Um, and for us, uh, scale, and I'll explain that in, in more details in the next slide, but scale for us is not only lab and having nodes, uh, compute nodes, but it's also how to have a proper production environment where you can uh, confidently deploy production applications uh, on, on robust uh, um, um, platforms, right? Um, we will also talk about how actually uh, we use Kubernetes to help uh, operate uh, uh, OpenStack. And this is very, very important. As I said, uh, we've been doing open, OpenStack for the last 10 years, more than 10 years. Um, and as a result of the experience we have running OpenStack at scale for all of these different customers we have, Kubernetes is one of the solutions uh, that we came, uh, uh, what, what actually we decided to use to reduce the complexity of managing OpenStack. We'll also explain why uh, OpenStack Helm only is not sufficient, uh, basically compared to uh, running uh, other operators on top of, of uh, Kubernetes to run OpenStack, um, and how Kubernetes actually is helped to do smart lifecycle management system, uh, to fix some challenges around the updates of OpenStack, for example, and scaling out of, of OpenStack. So let's go into, into the uh, uh, important part of the, of the presentation. What do I mean by scale? Again, we have various ways of seeing scale. Uh, as I explained, we don't want to tackle the problem of having lab environments, right? So lab environments where you can add 500, 800, 1,000, 2,000 nodes in a cluster, we can, we can tweak OpenStack to, to make that work. That, there is no question around that. Uh, but the real uh, and important aspect to understand when running OpenStack at scale is how you can make a production environment working at scale. And that, that goes beyond only tweaking OpenStack. Uh, that's also associated with uh, how can I maintain uh, my OpenStack cluster? What is my block radius around OpenStack? What would happen if I lose my control plane in, in OpenStack? Uh, so how can I scale out my control plane to make sure that I don't don't lose I don't lose my OpenStack my OpenStack cluster? Another important aspect is how many people do I need to maintain that large cluster? Is it a small team? Is it a small team? What are the competencies I need? Is it networking, storage, uh, KVM or kernel expertise? So you have to take all of this into consideration when scaling out environments. It's not only about the technology itself, but you have a lot of auxiliary things that you need to consider, right? So here in that, in, that, in that slide, what we try to explain is when we consider production environments at scale, when we consider SLAs, and typically in many of the production environments you are trying to get 99.9% or 99.99% SLAs, uh, or API uptime SLAs, in that case, uh, deploying and operating OpenStack is very, very uh, different than just, just tweaking OpenStack, right? As I said, um, we've been doing OpenStack for more than 10 years. We have um, very large iconic customers like et in the US, Ericsson in, in Europe, uh, Booking.com in Europe. Um, and there we have uh, 
massive footprint in terms of, like for example, Booking.com, we have 8,000 servers, right? We are running 8,000 servers for Booking.com. Uh, at at and we have more than 20,000 so, uh, sockets that we are running, that we are running for, for, for at and And very uh, early at that deployment and, and maintenance stage, we understood that one of the biggest challenges we would have is how to upgrade, how to upgrade OpenStack. Um, that has always been one of the biggest challenges in, in OpenStack. The capability of OpenStack to upgrade without having downtime, right? Um, as we develop the various iterations of product within Mirantis, one of the um, learnings that we had was that we needed a strong and robust lifecycle management system to manage OpenStack at scale so that we could reduce the amount of human intervention in deploying the clusters, uh, updating the clusters, scaling out the clusters. And the answer to this is Kubernetes. So since 2019 now, we've been running OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. Uh, but then again, Kubernetes itself is not, is not solution. You need to develop uh, um, what we call operators to kind of bring the intelligence into how to properly manage all the different operations of running op um, OpenStack on top of, on top of Kubernetes, right? And that's what we'll be, we'll be looking into today. Uh, what we mean by these operators, how many operators uh, we, we developed, what is our strategy around these, these operators, and also uh, some of the com um, uh, things that we will be giving back to the, to the community as open source, open source uh, projects. There's actually an important point missing on this, uh, on this last slide. Um, yeah, sorry. The one. Yes. Uh, it is not sufficient to just build OpenStack at scale to run OpenStack at scale. It's also uh, pretty crucially important that you will be able to run the OpenStack cloud over time, keep it, uh, uh, keep it viable <coughs> over time. Uh, and this is one of the uh, problems that we had with early lifecycle management system. This is not our first lifecycle management system. And uh, in the end, the cloud looks like, like a mess. It's just jumbled together. This is, uh, changes have been made here, changes have been made there, and they do not match everything. So this is also an important aspect of uh, introducing Kubernetes as the orchestrator underneath OpenStack that allows us to uh, keep the cloud streamlined over time and make it, uh, have it not only be viable today, but they will be viable for the next three, four, five, six years that you're going to run this cloud until you upgrade to the next system. Thank you. All right. So these are, these are the standard building blocks uh, of, of OpenStack, right? So you start with your data center, whether you have one site or, or multiple sites. Uh, that's the base, 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 I would say, base layer. On top of which you have a network infrastructure, uh, your servers, physical servers. You start to select the operating system on which you want to run the different services. Then you have the core OpenStack uh, solution, uh, the infrastructure layer components, software defined networking, storage system, logging, monitoring, alerting, and then any other tooling, like for example, related to security, interface, API, and all that, right? So that's, that's I would say, the, the standard building, building blocks. And you would be creating or building your, your, your and you be building or creating your clouds around OpenStack using these, using these standard blocks. Uh, you need LMA, for example, to have proper visibility of what is happening in your cloud, and you need LMA to be able to monitor what is happening at the very low level, bare metal, uh, host operating system, and then on, in the upper layers, right? So you need your LMA, for example, to go and get the metrics and logs from OpenStack, but also from, from the software-defined network storage, and software-defined networking and storage uh, components, and also the other tooling. Um, again, on that part, you can always tweak and modify each and every layers to get the better performance. Like, for example, on the networking, uh, component, you have ways of improving the performance of the SDN, uh, whether it is OBS or some other SDN solution. The same for storage, right? Uh, we've been tweaking to get the best out of, of Ceph, for example, in terms of IOPS. Um, and OpenStack also, the way that you can configure OpenStack in terms of managing message queues, whether you want one message queue, multiple message queues, cluster message queues, non cluster message queues. You can always tweak things within OpenStack to get better performance. But again, today we will be concentrating on another element of the scale, which is more the maintenance uh, and, and operation part. 
And for that, uh, as I say, our solution is Kubernetes. Based on our experience and for the time that we've been running, we've been running OpenStack for our different customers, we found that we needed that advanced LCM, which is then deployed and, and managed through Kubernetes, to be able to uh, operate all the different operations across OpenStack, across the infrastructure components, across the software-defined networking, storage network, LMA, and other tooling. So today we have a couple of operators that we have built. We have an operator which runs to manage OpenStack. We have an operator to manage Ceph. We have an operator to manage uh, our SDN. So we have OBS, OVN, and Tungsten Fabric. Well, now it's called OpenSDN. Uh, for the networking components, we have an operator for LMA, which is based on Prometheus, Profana, Kibana, etc., etc. So we have all these operators that are, are deployed in Kubernetes. And they talk to each other so that it makes all sense of how to um, deploy uh, and also run the different operations uh, of, of OpenStack, Ceph, and the SDN. Right? And we'll go into more details in the next slides. Do you want to give some examples here, Christian, of, of uh, how we've been doing that for some customers? Right, so I would like to step in back in time a little bit uh, before, until before that, which uh, basically first of all, uh, slide back, and the Kubernetes is missing. We have been running OpenStack like this for many years, and uh, it was viable. We have had customers who trusted their whole business on it. The downside to it was that upgrading, every upgrade was a major operation, and I'm talking about months of hard work, I'm talking about interruption of services, which is uh, again going back to what Daniel said about scale before. Scale is not only size, scale is also uh, uninterrupted uh, delivery of the services. Scale is um, being able to quickly get to the core of the issue if something happens. And uh, we have customers. We have customers complain to us. Yeah, this is uh, taking so long, but it takes so long because it is, uh, it is uh, endlessly complicated. Pretty much everything has to be done by hand or by some automation that has been custom written for this. So um, the reason why we ended up essentially throwing away the previous system and starting from scratch with Kubernetes as the other leg was that we wanted to get rid of this. We wanted to be able to have seamless upgrades. We wanted to be able to have the upgrades would only take a couple of days uh, at first. Um, the upgrades would be predictable, that they would be um, pretty much not felt by the people who are actually using the workloads on top of the cloud, which is getting us to the, to the rolling upgrades. So the Kubernetes layer in between that has become sort of the um, glue that holds all this together. And now here you see that we have um, essentially components that are not really connected to each other. The only thing that connects it is what's not visible here. This is an automation layer that you customize for this. The downside to that, of course, is that if you write this custom, you're basically reinventing the wheel. We have a tool that can already do this, and this tool is pretty good. So, Yes. Um, so, for, for instance, let's say we have a um, service board crashing. If I have a, uh, the service running as a script, as a unit script on, the, on uh, one of the nodes, if it crashes, I have to figure out to resolve it. I first have to determine that it is down, and then I have to restart it. If I have the same thing with Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes can restart the port, but it needs to know whether it can or whether it should restart the port or not. It doesn't know what, what exactly the status is. So these, uh, these um, uh, orchestration components that we are writing for this are essentially what um, enables Kubernetes to see into our OpenStack cluster and uh, allow Kubernetes to take action on things that are not visible for the, for the naked eye before they become uh, a major issue. Things like a crash port, let's say a crash uh, Nova port on some, uh, uh, some node, um, Kubernetes can automatically restart that. If you are using um, handwritten orchestration, you have to make sure that all these uh, things are done, and you have to, uh, to create the conditions, you have to uh, make sure that uh, you're not accidentally restarting something that doesn't need restarting, that's all. So Kubernetes, we are using the, the capabilities of Kubernetes to make this happen. So 
one of the major advantages of running OpenStack in Kubernetes is that Kubernetes is a well-known component. It can be used, there's a lot of tooling around it uh, inside, it uh, inside into the uh, running processes. And so the API can be used, we have, for instance, uh, we uh, use Lens quite a bit, maybe, maybe known to quite a few of you, um, to control or to, uh, to look into what our OpenStack cluster is doing. And so uh, this API essentially become, becomes what is controlling the cloud, or right how, how we are controlling the components that control the cloud. Uh, auto reconciling, uh, uh, out, sorry, <laughs> auto reconciliation of OpenStack con component and service configuration is also an important point. This is what I, uh, what I was referring to before. I said uh, a cloud can look like a total mess after a couple of years because somebody has ch uh, changed things on some, some nodes but not on other nodes. And Kubernetes is very good at keeping workloads um, in line, keeping them uh, in the same configuration. Yes, yeah, so it's only telling it to change the configuration once and then this is changed across uh, all the service nodes that we have. So we're working abstractions, of course. Um, Kubernetes is uh, very good at um, basic networking. And we are using this as the underlay of our uh, cloud and put, put the overlay, uh, overlay network depending on which one we want to use um, uh, OBS, um, Tungsten Fabric, or, uh, uh, or now also OVN. And, and this is basically running on top of this uh, abstra abstracted layer. Yes, there is a little bit of a performance delta. We have uh, seen that, but this performance, uh, the uh, advantages of this far outweigh what, you, what you're losing there. Then uh, if this, is, uh, this is, for me, the most important point of all, uh, the roaming updates. Being able to uh, update an OpenStack cloud while everyone is using it and not getting a whole bunch of really angry phone calls that uh, uh, some things are not uh, working the way they are supposed to. And we have perfected this to the way that we basically we used to tell our customers that um, if you want to do an upgrade, this will take a long time of planning and then you would, are going to do the upgrade, so you do an upgrade maybe every year or so and only hot fixes in between or every other year and a half. And now we are telling the customers, to upgrade with every release because the upgrade is very, uh, very quick and uh, that makes it a lot easier for us to not have to figure out uh, upgrade procedures from three different prior versions to the current version because uh, the customer is on that or have to take the customer through every version and, uh, which is also going to be just as expensive. <coughs> so lightness and readiness probes. That is uh, also what I was referring to before, is that um, Kubernetes needs to be able to see what's actually going on inside those OpenStack um, services. It's not sufficient that the pod is running. We actually need to make sure that the service is running. So there's a, a number of custom probes that are built for the, uh, to make this happen. And then uh, the self-healing of the OpenStack components. So if a pod dies and you, it, uh, it is defined properly in Kubernetes, Kubernetes will just uh, create another one and make uh, and the, the, class, the service, the cluster is healing itself without anyone really noticing it. And it will know, the readiness probes will know long before you are looking at your uh, mock display or at, the, uh, at your uh, monitoring. The, uh, the service will know very quickly whether something is running or not. Um, and so there, there is this delay from when something goes wrong until it gets fixed. Shrink, shrinks way down. Yeah. Um, I, I, I add a few, a few um, remarks also on this one. Um, if you look at auto reconciliation, for example, um, one very important aspect is you want to define a state. You want to define an end state, and in, in, in the middle, you don't really know how you will reach that end state. And this is where it is interesting uh, with Kubernetes because when you do, do, uh, or do, you do want to apply GitOps, you have all your developers or DevOps that are manipulating these YAML files. And ultimately, at some point, when you get that um, final YAML configuration, you apply that to the, to the um, uh, operator, Kubernetes operator. One, you want to make sure that there are no errors in that YAML file. And this is one of the rules of the operator. It will check the syntax of that YAML file and say, OK, I'm not going to do anything because the version of the Kubernetes uh, of the OpenStack release that you're asking is not supported. 
Let's say, for example, I want to move from Antilo to Caracal. If Caracal is not supported, it's not an officially supported version, it will not apply anything, right? And you want to have this type of checks because if you, it starts to kind of download and pull images that are not validated, then it, at some point we'll get issues. Um, the second thing is also, uh, and this is also related to rolling updates and self healing. As you want to define that state, you will have the automatic retries uh, based on if you can't deploy uh, the pods or the services in a given uh, controller or computer node because of, let's say, for example, you have a catastrophic failure and you need to restart all the services at the same time. Typically, you have some race conditions. Then you need to have a system that kind of automatically retries at, until at some point you reach that final state, right? So auto, auto reconciliation is, is one of the very important aspects of, of using Kubernetes. Rich networking abstraction also is very, very important because if you look at the way that you would be doing that without Kubernetes, that means that you need to define the IPs. You need to understand which IPs are used for the databases, which IPs are used for your services. When you do kill some of the services or some of the services are, are, are failed, you need to make sure that you are reconfiguring properly the new service with the right IP that is reserved and not conflicting with another IP, right? With Kubernetes, it's all done automatically. Like, like for example, if you're looking at self-healing, I'm destroying a pod, I know that even if the pod is going to get a new pod IP, it's not going to be a problem because my service IP is still the same and the service discovery is still the same, so I don't need to do all these manual configuration. It's, it, it just simplifies at scale the, the, the configuration and management of the, of the cluster. Rolling updates, obviously, this is something which is, which, is, which is definitely key. But one thing which is important with the rolling updates is what we try to achieve each and every time, whether it is control plane or data plane, is no service downtime. This is very, very important for us. Uh, for example, in Mirantis, we use OpenStack for our own development and testing uh, environments. Uh, we release OpenStack uh, releases, well, product releases every three, three or four weeks. So each three or four weeks, there is an update happening on our platforms. And this is completely transparent for the whole, the whole teams because there is a team who, who is dedicated to do that, and the other teams don't actually see that we are applying the patches every three or four weeks. Liveliness and readiness probes. Well, Kubernetes does not really know what is happening in OpenStack. It does know that a pod is running, but it doesn't know that the pod is properly running, right? So what we did for OpenStack is actually we made some modifications in some of the OpenStack services so that Kubernetes could get the insights of what is actually running inside these pods and make sure that the, service, the services are actually running. And all of this has now been, been upstream or we, we are in the process of upstreaming all these modifications so that if other people or other communities want to leverage these operators, they can also do that. Now the question is, why did we go into the route of using operators and not, and not only simple, simply help charts? And that's, that's a good question, because you can, you can definitely use Helm charts to deploy uh, OpenStack services uh, today on Kubernetes, right? If you look at Open, OpenStack Helm community, you have all these Helm charts that have already been built so that you can basically deploy, deploy uh, OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. But the reason that we uh, uh, went beyond only Helm charts is because you have a lot of, of interactions or dependencies when you are doing all these operations uh, when manipulating or managing OpenStack. Like for example, the dependencies between networking and OpenStack, or dependencies between OpenStack and storage, or even hardware or uh, operating system and kernel uh, updates with, with OpenStack, right? So uh, at the end of the day, we say, uh, okay, we need to have some advanced lifecycle management, uh, and the advanced lifecycle management basically in Kubernetes is the operator that you build. Um, which then solves a lot of these of these issues. Like for example, here if you look at um, doing doing updates and upgrades, uh, you would want, for example, to start to look at whether the VMs needs to be migrated before doing any modifications on a given on a given computer. Right? Uh, for this to to happen, you need to have a system that says, okay, I know that the operating system is being updated, kernel update. I need to reboot the the compute node so that that. Uh, computer needs to be evacuated. Um, so you have some logic doing that, talking to the OpenStack operator, and the, then OpenStack operator will start to migrate out the VMs automatically, evacuate these compute nodes, and then you can start to apply the modifications on these compute nodes, right? So all of this logic is being done uh, through the interaction of these operators and through the operator logic itself, 
right, that we've built. So today you have a coordination between our four or five main uh, operators. We have one operator for OpenStack, one operator for Ceph, one operator for uh, SDN, uh, so basically OpenSDN in that case, uh, and OpenOVN. Uh, we have one operator for the LMA, and we have one operator which manages the um, low-level low level, uh, um, modifications or procedures, operating system level and Kubernetes uh, level. So I started to, to talk a little bit about some of these of these advanced or small type cycle management systems that we implemented inside these, these operators, right? So these operators, as I said, this is represented by that, that this brain. Uh, you have one for OpenStack, SDN, and SDS, plus LMA and, and low levels. Um, one example is when we do an OpenStack version upgrade. When we do this OpenStack version upgrade, again, you have a lot of moving parts. Uh, very simple example, you have a Nova API restart, for example. Then you need to do uh, DB synchronization, and many times you have multiple DB synchronization that needs to be done. And then you start to, to restart, the, restart the conductors, right? So if you only use hand charts, hand charts will not do that. You will need to start to implement that logic to understand, okay, I'm going to update my OpenStack version, which means that first I need to back up my database, uh, do the Nova uh, API restart, and then start to do my first DB sync, do some stuff, do another DB sync, and then to restart all the other services, right? So all of this is, is then done by that operator, which is then written in Go code, which is, uh, have provides some performance also. Uh, but uh, if you don't do that with that kind of operator, then you'll need to implement that, right? And Charles does, does not do that out of the box. Again, you have this synchronization again in between these different these, 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 these different components. Um, Christian, you want to give some examples here of, of where we did that for customers, like full stack updates and all the different uh, interactions we have? I'm thinking about a very specific customer who is currently um, started, uh, we had, we are still discussing the upgrade from Merant's MCP, the previous version of Lifecycle Management, to uh, Merant's OpenStack. I cannot take it, uh, uh, name the name, but it's a large dark hook. The, uh, uh, the reason why this is uh, all taking a long time is because um, the upgrades in MCP were very complicated and the customer has uh, kind of the same expectations for now. Whereas what we are actually going to do for them is going to be much uh, much faster and much smarter than we, than we are going to, or than, than they are expecting at this point. So if you are essentially have no logic to bind the whole cloud together, here we see we do not have operators, we are using Kubernetes, we have deployed the cloud without, without chart or with a set of cloud charts. Um, there is basically no response to if, if anything fails. If the API fails, really not really that much of a problem for you. Um, this can be repaired. This is really not, uh, it's not catastrophic because the, at least the services that you're already running are continuing to keep running. But if you have failures on either the SDN or SDS side, um, this uh, will, will disrupt your service and this will lead to very many angry phone ca uh, customer phone calls. And uh, so we will really want to get back from the, uh, or away from this model that we uh, have um, uh, isolated failures, SDN is broken, and we do not have any way to control it other than try to apply, either apply uh, other help trouble to manual troubleshooting. So next slide, please. Yeah, just on this, um, also, in, the, in this interaction, for example, we know that we will we rarely start with doing the upgrade, upgrade of the SDS before we <coughs> start. Uh, we typically start by doing the upgrade of the uh, OpenStack first, and then the last element will be will be will be Ceph in that case. If we use uh, Ceph as the SDS, so again we have these the, the interaction when we we have a very simple way of doing these updates, right? So we modify the YAML file, we apply the YAML file uh, or YAML files depending on on the amount of um, things that we want to upgrade. Uh, the operator will start then to sync in between them. Uh, and in that case, if it detects that, for example, we need to update both OpenStack and Ceph, uh, it will automatically start with OpenStack first. So we start to pull in the images. So we pre-cache the older images before applying any changes. We pre-cache the images on all the required nodes. And once this is done, then we start to um, apply these modifications in a rolling update mode. Even when we are in a running update mode, and I think we are going to talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, right? Yeah. Yeah. In this one. 
uh, even if we are in a rolling update mode, we always have a we always try to respect the budget. So let's say, for example, I have five pods uh, for my given my given uh, the neutron service. Okay, um, I will always try to have at least three pods instead of closing all the five pods at the same time. So I have three pods running, two pods down, and then I will, in a sliding window mode, uh, try to have another three pods. So I will start to. Um, in terms of rolling updates, upgrade all these different pods. Once this is done, so I pre cached all the images, I started all these images properly, then the controller will start to talk to the other controllers. So in that case, that will be the SDN first, and then the SDS first. Uh, SDS last, sorry. So an important part of all this is uh, that you, in the, at this point, when you're updating um, the, class, the cloud, not only cloud services, but uh, updating, for instance, operating, uh, operation system, you also have to be able to talk to the workloads themselves. So um, normally, we get a, a node evacuated by line migration, which you would normally have to do no, uh, by hand. In this case, the operator itself, this is what this arrow is, the operator itself first opens that like migrate the uh, workloads of that node that we are going to um, update and reboot. So the update reboot is not going to affect the workload. And uh, afterwards, when, that, when, this, when this first node is uh, updated, then we can migrate workloads onto it from another node, and we are going to do that. Um, we can do this either manually, or in our case, uh, we are, the, the automation is so going so far that it will actually automatically do this. It will just tell the node that it needs to be updated. The other thing, of course, is that uh, a secret design, as I said before, uh, it is uh, uh, unbelievably important to do everything in the right sequence uh, and also to detect if something has gone wrong and, and uh, mitigate that before you have to uh, uh, go on because you really never want to have more than one port down. And this is, uh, th uh, that's why when we are upgrading customers now, and I can't really bring an example, this is with our, all our customers, they have the same experience. On Musk, the upgrades are essentially a non-issue, and this is really a new thing for, for us in OpenStack that has uh, made, a, made a huge difference for our availability, SLAs, everything, um, and taken the um, kind of, I would almost say, fear away from customers. Oh, I have to do this update. This is going to be it's going to take a, a lot of time, and it's going to uh, disrupt my service. It's essentially just something now that happens. It's like you like you bring your car to the service, and uh, it, it gets fixed, and, 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 and uh, everything continues. So one thing that I also would like to point out is the cluster lifecycle management on the other side. The operators for OpenStack, for SDN, for SDS, um, they are uh, good at what they are doing but they need somebody to tell them what to do. Specifically, if you want to also uh, like, uh, uh, manage the bare metal layer underneath, which uh, uh, or the most, most operating system layer specifically, uh, 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 there is a, needs to be a cluster lifecycle management <coughs> component. We have an extra lifecycle management system that does builds everything from the, cloud, from the uh, ground up. So uh, the only thing that really needs to be done to make uh, was to, uh, to install one node manually that is uh, the, the, the image that starts uh, uh, that, that manages uh, all the bare metal nodes uh, later on. So whether you are built, whether you scale out, whether you replace nodes for, for various reasons, this is what the cluster lifecycle management component over there does. And it's also an operator. Yes. So just to summarize before we go into the details of uh, some other modifications we made in the code. So here, um, as you can see, we have four operators. Actually, we have five, one which is not represented, but we have four important operators. One for the lifecycle management system. And this is important for both day one and day two. Day one, because you'll start deploying with that initial building block, which means that if you want to start your servers, IPMI uh, start, for example, Pixie Boot, uh, you start to deploy the operating system, any required components within the, the operating system, this is the, the component that will be doing that. Right? So we deploy, we develop something in Kubernetes to do that, again to help to add new servers, whether it, these are controller nodes, uh, compute nodes, or storage nodes. But this is also important for day two because all the updates will be going through this, through this operator. All the low-level updates 
operating system and, and component updates in the operating system will be going through this component. Then you have all the application related uh, controllers, so OpenStack uh, related, SDN related, and SDN uh, related. And they all talk to each other, so they all are continuously syncing to know what is happening, uh, get the, provide the right metrics to the LMA stack to know whether a node is up or down, whether a disk is up or down, whether uh, the, an open stack service is properly running or not, whether the SDN is properly functioning, whether the SDS is properly or providing the right level of, of performance. So, right? so this is very, 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 very important. So this gives importance not only to operate the cluster, but also, again, to fix one of the biggest issues of OpenStack, which is updates and upgrades, and to do, to do that as rapidly as possible, as consistently as possible, so that the user experience is, is better when running, when running OpenStack. Right. So we have a plan now to open source these different controllers. We will start with the OpenStack, so by beginning of 2025, we will have that OpenStack controller being uh, open source. And then we will have a roadmap to open source the SDN1, the SDS1, and the uh, cluster lifecycle management system one. But we want to now start to give back to the community all the developments we've made. Uh, we already have some of the OpenStack Helm uh, uh, components that we are looking at how to upstream, and then also the controller uh, in, in very, very, very soon. Um, some other indications we made. Uh, Basil, if you're still online, do you want to share a little bit some other development your team made across these different um, projects? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes we can. Uh, okay, thank you, perfect. <laughs> so, uh, as it was uh, highlighted uh, many times here, so to provide the robust uh, day two, uh, operations uh, for our deployment, it's important for life cycle management uh, to have ability to correctly identify uh, when the service startup is completed. Uh, and it's important from several aspects. Uh, so, uh, for example, in OpenStack, there are some components that during st startup may cause additional load on the system. Uh, such as Neutron OS or Neutron L3 agent, and uh, if uh, too many components will be initializing simultaneously, so it may overwhelm uh, the case services such as uh, Neutron Server or Database or RabbitMQ, which is weak point in OpenStack deployment, and uh, may potentially lead to uh, servers slowdowns or even uh, failures. So oh, this is one of aspect why the startup um, uh, knowledge why LCM should clearly understand when service startup is completed. Another aspect is that some components uh, they are um, crucial for maintaining user facing uh, workloads and uh, providing data planes for them and storage. So, for example, open the switch and tungsten fabric routers. If they are not running, the user workload will not have network connectivity. Uh, so uh, we need to clearly understand when open the switch and neutron OVS agents uh, uh, or tungsten fabric routers after startup when they think it is state uh, to uh, to know when we are ready to uh, restart the next replica or uh, when we can proceed with updating another node. Uh, another example of uh, such service is CFOSD. So if we will restart too many SD at the same time, it may cause uh, CF to move some volumes into read-only mode when the replication factor uh, is not meet uh, for, for them for data placement. So that's why uh, it's also crucial to understand when CFOSD startup is completed for LCM before moving next. Uh, yes, so what's the solution in OpenStack? Unfortunately, in OpenStack, uh, there is no unified API that can uh, present the internal state of the service uh, outside. And uh, we did some modification into OpenStack code to handle that because uh, it's very important thing in the Kubernetes uh, and automated uh, way. 
Uh, yeah, and as it was highlighted by Daniel, we will be open sourcing this thing uh, later. Um, so another aspect uh, that uh, can arise when you manage in big clusters on Kubernetes uh, at scale is uh, some unexpected situations like power outages. So and. Uh, we observe that when the huge clusters uh, went into power outage, it's uh, maybe problematic to start uh, up them uh, because, uh, as you know, in Kubernetes, uh, the dependencies between services typically are resolved by init containers, so it's small code that try and uh, before the main service and it checks that all dependencies they emit, and it usually uh, talks to Kubernetes API. So uh, if uh, that uh, init containers and uh, poll scripts, uh, they too aggressive, do too aggressive polling, it may kill Kubernetes API or slow down it. So possible solution is to apply rate limiting on Kubernetes API side or add uh, random back of DLA into the polling scripts. Uh, yeah, next slide, please, uh, number 13. So, other very important problem, and which is well known in OpenStack community, is scalability of managing of uh, messaging component. Yes, so uh, and uh, this is a big problem for components that are in on hypervisors. So, for example, Nova Compute and Neutron agents, uh, which uh, pieces are running on the each uh, compute host. So OpenStack community heavily working uh, on trying to mitigate this scalability problem. And one of examples is to use uh, their own QS alternative to messaging, which is not, I would say, very quite popular. Uh, another thing that was done in Nova recently is uh, sales V2 implementation, which allows you to have dedicated repeating queue and database instances per Nova cells, but it's increased uh, 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 update uh, orchestration logic uh, complexity even more. So, uh, in some cases, uh, 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 the scalability can be improved by using non cluster attribute MQ cluster. Uh, so, OpenStack evolved uh, during last years and uh, it's uh, like more robust right now and more resilient to RabbitMQ restarts and message losses. And it uses RabbitMQ pre preliminary for remote procedure calls. So uh, we, we are using single RabbitMQ node deployment in our uh, production clusters uh, for, for years uh, and uh, it behaves well. Uh, yeah, of course, we should not forget about some fundamental tuning when we are talking about scalability, like the system layer tuning, like we can collect number of maximum connections for service or maximum number of open files. And OpenStack levels uh, layer, it's uh, like tuning of some amounts uh, and uh, number of workers, replicas, ATCD, it's all very uh, specific to specific use case, how cloud is used, how API is used, how many nodes you are running. Yeah, next slide, please, number 14. And uh, uh, last thing that I would like to highlight here is that uh, the scalability of entry system, much like uh, the security, is uh, determined by weakest component. So in our, our ecosystem, we added Kubernetes as a component into it uh, behind OpenStack. So Kubernetes scalability is also very important. And there are some um, uh, important uh, things and uh, like uh, challenges that we learned uh, while running uh, Kubernetes with, uh, with the scale. So simultaneous pod restarts, uh, they can occur after power outage or during initial deployment and uh, they may, <coughs> may add some issues. So, and we found issues when running Kubernetes with Docker container runtime that uh, simultaneous uh, uh, pod restarts, they had some problems uh, on starting a specific scale. Also, a container runtime is very important in Kubernetes because some container when, uh, runtimes like Docker, when uh, we restart it, it uh, starts a uh, process that's running in Kubernetes, which also may be 
uh, crucial for the workloads, uh, and uh, so uh, the container runtime should be carefully picked. Um, uh, another important aspect is spot uh, density per node. So by default, Kubernetes recommends to use uh, 110 pods per node. It's sufficient for typical deployments, uh, but for bare-metal deployments, uh, it's uh, very small number. And in our experience, uh, this value can be safely increased up to 250 pods, and it allows to have better resource utilization for now. Uh, the last aspect I would like to focus uh, and stop on is uh, ETCD performance because ETCD is uh, heard of Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes project data in uh, the ETCD, uh, including event logs and during data operation. Um, <coughs> when massive restart the course, uh, the event subsystem can generate uh, significant data uh, load on event subsystem. So to mitigate this, uh, Consider to uh, use either dedicated ETCD clusters just for storing Kubernetes events, or uh, or and plus consider increasing default ETCD storage quota. By default, it's two gigabytes, and uh, we recommend to increasing it up to eight gigabytes uh, or even more. Um, yeah, I think this is uh, all. Okay. Points uh, that I wanted to highlight here, yeah, and I give. Uh, uh, thank you, Vasil. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Vasil. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your attendance. Um, I hope it was useful for you. If you do want to talk to us, we are at booth 15, so don't hesitate to come. Again, thank you. Thank you very much.